All right, welcome to lecture number 21. Uh, this is the second part of uh, my lecture on psychedelic drugs. And the last lecture focused on uh, MDMA, uh, mescaline, and scopolamine and uh, related drugs. In this particular drug, I'm going to focus on hallucinogenic compounds. In particular, we'll talk about LSD and related compounds such as psilocybin. We'll also spend some time talking about the potential therapeutic uses of some of these drugs. So we'll start uh, by talking about LSD and psilocybin. Then we'll talk more about ketamine, PCP, and dextromethorphan. Uh, and then finally, uh, some treatment potential for these uh, Start with what hallucinogens really are. The predominant drugs in this class are all serotonergic. Uh, so lysergic acid diethylamide uh, is LSD. Psilocybin and psilocin are uh, related compounds. And their actions on serotonin receptors is not entirely clear, but their structural formulas um, of serotonin and 6-serotonin-like psychedelic drugs show they are fairly similar. So if we take a look at these compounds, at the top we have serotonin, uh, next down we have DMT, uh, which is uh, another uh, psychedelic in this compound. We're going to talk about uh, psilocybin and LSD uh, here towards the bottom. And you can see these sort of are progressively um, different variations of the 5-HT um, uh, molecule, and so that's our belief that these are serotonergic, and there is uh, pretty solid evidence for that. So the effects of these drugs include visual distortions and psychic effects, and they really predominate over any somatic effects. Uh, changes in mood, thought disruption, altered time perception, depersonalization, hallucinations, and the potential for psychotic episodes are all hallmarks of this class. But in particular, visual hallucinations, altered perception, altered perception of time, uh, and that sort of dissociation or depersonalization uh, are some of the hallmarks of these particular uh, drugs. So let's talk a little bit about the history of LSD. It's the, um, the big player in this group. In 1943, uh, Hoffman was experimenting with ergot derivatives, uh, which is a type of fungus, and actually absorbed some of this stuff through his skin and he described and reported some sensory distortions of this particular drug. So scientific interest developed because of the hallucinations um, in the idea that perhaps this was sort of a drug analog of schizophrenia. But the hallucinations are uh, completely unlike those in schizophrenia, and we'll talk more about schizophrenia when we get to um, discussing antipsychotic drugs um, in a while down the road, uh, but these are not the same type of hallucination, so it really wasn't a good analog. A lot of the interest and discussion around LSD uh, focused on and has focused on sort of neo-Freudian, Jungian psychology and uh, using these drugs to sort of uh, tap into unconscious or uh, different types of consciousness. Um, there's also a whole history of uh, really unethical and illegal use in, in both military and uh, central intelligence agency experiments, and we'll talk more about that here in just a second. So, uh, Timothy Leary and Ken Casey were sort of part of the two, turn on, tune in, and drop out movement of the 1960s. Um, there was attempts at using LSD in psychotherapy. This was entirely unsuccessful. A lot of unreliable protocols and measures, um, but there was a dramatic increase in the rec rec yeah, recreational use of psychedelic drugs. Uh, we also know that the CIA and other government agencies engaged in secret experiments. These resulted in a few deaths. One guy jumped out of a window. Um, the CIA experiments, as I recall, were designed to try to come up with a way to unseat Fidel Castro and uh, make him appear psychotic. Um, that obviously did not work. So, um, LSD was made illegal in the 1960s and placed in Schedule One. Um, of category of abuse substances not suitable for therapeutic use. Part of this response uh, was to the thalidomide epidemic of birth defects, and so there was a move to get anything that might um, be associated with that kind of drug uh, into Schedule 1 
So let's talk then about the pharmacokinetics of LSD. Um, LSD is rapidly absorbed orally and peaks around three hours after absorption. This is a very uh, uh, potent psychoactive drug. Only about 1% of it gets into the brain, and uh, the dosage here is very low. So the usual dose is 25 to 300 micrograms. Um, because of this low dosing, it's very difficult to detect in urine. It can be detected for about 30 hours, but it's very difficult because there's so little of it. Um, LSD has a long half-life. Um, it's distributed easily throughout the body, brain, and placenta. It's metabolized in the liver. Uh, and has low toxicity. The lethal dose of, L L lethal dose of LSD is 14,000 micrograms. Um, so overdosing with LSD is particularly difficult. Again, it's absorbed very quickly. It's usually just sort of licked as a stamp or you know, something like that. Um, and uh, generally, that low dose is sufficient uh, for uh, people to get the experience they're looking for. So there are several different psychological effects. The perceptual phase is associated with sort of colored lights and distorted vivid images. Um, some people can find these unpleasant and panic experiences may occur because they might be overwhelmed due to these visual and emotional effects. Some adverse reactions include potentially flashbacks. This is called hallucinogen persisting perception disorder. And this is a major long-term effect that is generally associated with heavy use, uh, not with light use. Uh, these are, there is a rapid onset uh, and uh, there is loss of tolerance to these uh, particular drugs relatively quickly. Uh, there are no physical withdrawal symptom, symptoms either with LSD. So this is not a drug that's addicting, um, but it does not have uh, any currently approved uh, medical use. And we'll talk about uh, LSD microdosing here in just a bit. So other serotonin-like hallucinogens include DMT, which is a short-acting version of LSD. Uh, this must be smoked or sniffed, that is, it's inactive orally, um, often included in marijuana cigarettes. It's uh, metabolized by monoamine oxidase and may be bound to sigma-1 receptors as a mode of possible action. Its onset is rapid within two minutes, only has about a 30-minute period of effect. Uh, it's one of the two main ingredients in ayahuasca, which um, is an herbal compound uh, people travel to Central America and South America for. So that's a quick overview of DMT. Uh, psilocybin uh, and uh, psilocin, which are related compounds. These are two psychedelic agents found in many species of mushrooms, in particular sort of what we call magic mushrooms. Uh, this exerts an agonist effect at 5-HT2A and 5-HT1A. Very similar to the effects of er other serotonin psychedelics at about 0.25 milligrams per kilogram of body weight when ingested. It's about 1 200th as potent as LSD, and the effects of this can last from about 6 to 10 hours. Uh, it's well absorbed orally uh, when eaten raw. It is... Uh, lipid soluble, so when it's consumed along with uh, fat, uh, it will be absorbed more readily and probably more of it will be absorbed. So the active compounds will be absorbed uh, in combination with fat, which is oftentimes why they are, why they are included uh, as pizza toppings or uh, can also be ingested as a candy. We'll talk about similar dosing with uh, THC uh, later on. This drug produces hallucinations and sensory distortions resembling those produced by LSD, but at a much uh, lower uh, level. So not uh, the intense effects that you would see with LSD, but the same kind of colors, bright colors. Colors appear uh, very vivid, uh, and you can get some other sorts of sensory distortions. So that gets us then to the glutaminergic NMDA receptor antagonists, which include PCB, PCP, sorry, ketamine, and dextromethorphan. Uh, these are structurally unrelated to other psychedelic drugs. These are completely unlike uh, the drugs we've just been talking about, uh, like LSD and psilocybin. Uh, PCP and ketamine are fairly similar to one another, but completely, as you can say, structurally different from the drugs we've been talking about. Uh, these do not affect uh, serotonin, but actually the NMDA receptor these were first developed as surgical anesthetics. They can produce rather bizarre and serious psychotic reactions, 
including agitation, excitement, delirium, distortion, hallucinations, and out-of-body experiences. In particular, PCP is well known for causing serious psychotic reactions and can be particularly dangerous, more often for people who are around people who are doing PCP. So we'll spend some time talking about PCP and how it works, and then we'll move on to talk about ketamine. So PCP um, was briefly used as an anesthetic in humans, uh, and was abandoned because of the high incidence of psychiatric reactions, uh, induced psychosis, etc. In terms of the pharmacokinetics of PCP, it's usually eaten, snorted, or injected. It's most often smoked. Um, oftentimes, in uh, it's included along with uh, marijuana. It has a long half-life of about 18 hours, so this is a long ride. Um, and that's what's responsible for its amnestic effect, is it's part of its long half-life. Um, Sold as angel dust primarily is what it's called. Uh, its mechanism of action is it blocks to and binds NMDA receptors on glutamate neurons. And because of that long action on uh, NMDA receptors in the hippocampus, uh, this is why we get reductions in memory for uh, time under the influence of this particular drug. So in terms of its dosage, dosage and effects, uh, it can be taken orally, sniffed, smoked, injected, or absorbed through mucosal tissues of the eyes, rectum, or vagina. And there are reports of this drug being taken in all of those ways. Uh, 5 to 10 milligrams generally produces relaxation, sort of warmth, tingling, numbness, distortions of body image, floating for six, four to six hours, along with maybe a mild depression. Higher doses is where we get into huge trouble. Um, produces analgesia, so pain relief, but also stupor, psychotic behavior, mania, sudden moon changes, disorientation, and confused and delusional thought. People can get very delusional, paranoid, crazy, wacko on this particular drug. So it's it's something I would have to say I would I would avoid. Ketamine, um, which people often refer to as Special K or Kitty, um, initially developed as an anesthetic or analgesic in the late 50s and 60s. Uh, it's primarily primarily used currently as a veterinary tranquilizer and anesthetic. Um, its main benefit is safety. Uh, it does not depress heart rate, breathing, or blood pressure. And it's actually what we call a dissociative anesthetic, in which a, fudge, a subject feels separated from their sensory experience. And so it will dissociate uh, from it. And so whatever sort of happened to them isn't happening to them. Uh, it's certainly been increasingly used as a club drug um, over the years. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, it has been newly approved, uh, at least a version of it has been, as an antidepressant. And we're going to talk more about that in uh, significant detail in uh, my lecture on SSRI plus and non-SSRI antidepressants. And that'll be coming up. So stay tuned for that. So this is uh, ketamine. It's sold to veterinarians, dissolved as a liquid, as you can see um, on the right. The primary source of illicit use is diverted and or stolen veterinary supplies. And so oftentimes uh, vet offices are broken into uh, to obtain supplies of this particular drug. The liquid then is usually allowed to evaporate and the resulting powder is delivered intranasally. And so um, at the top then is the powdered form of ketamine. And so the liquid is allowed to dry and then this precipitate uh, is allowed uh, is what is uh, actually uh, used. About 25 to 50% is absorbed and rapidly distributed, and the mean plasma elimination half-life is two and a half hours, so relatively quick um, half-life. The problem with ketamine is uh, it certainly can cause a um, number of issues, and so people get into what's called a K-hole. That is, they sort of... Uh, down the rabbit hole and don't know where they are. Um, and so it can be particularly dangerous. We'll talk more about uh, this particular drug and its use as an antidepressant uh, in more detail in a little bit. But um, it is certainly used uh, as a uh, club drug uh, in a number of places. And uh, very similar um, responses, uh, visual distortions, um, light trails, uh, colors changing, uh, etc. Dextromethorphan 
is a common ingredient in uh, over-the-counter cough suppressants. Um, so people will um, ingest very high amounts of these drugs. They call it robotripping, um, dexing, roboing. This can increase blood pressure, heart rate, and produces psychological behavioral activation and other somatic effects. Uh, this can be particularly dangerous, oftentimes along with the other drugs that are taken along with the dextromethorphan um, for this kind of um, psychological effect. I want to spend just a few minutes uh, talking about MDMA and its potential use for treating PTSD. LSD, microdosing, and psilocybin. And as I said, we'll talk about ketamine and depression uh, when we get to talking about antidepressants uh, later on. So MDMA and uh, PTSD, this is an emerging use of um, this particular drug. <coughs> Ecstasy was originally thought uh, to be useful as an antidepressant. It didn't really work out that well. But there is pretty good evidence uh, that using this drug alongside psychotherapy uh, is potentially uh, a way to treat post-traumatic stress disorder. So uh, these investigators found an 83% improvement in an MDA-treated group compared to 25% in a placebo group um, when psychotherapy was combined with MDMA. What seems to happen is that it allows patients to recall a traumatic experience without experiencing the fear. So it allows them to work through the trauma without being afraid while they're working through the trauma. And what we think then happens is we get reconsolidation of these experiences without the fear component. And this is a really interesting emerging part of um, ways in which we think we can treat uh, things like PTSD. And in a later lecture, I'm going to talk about um, propanolol in its treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and there's some really interesting work in this reconsolidation of memories without the affective component. And so that allows people to remember things without being afraid. And I think that's a really uh, interesting um, uh, finding. Now, the thing to keep in mind with uh, this particular treatment is this isn't taking ecstasy and sitting at home. It's taking ecstasy under the uh, supervision of a psychiatrist or psychologist and about eight hours of intensive that goes along with that. So this is uh, an emerging treatment, and so you'll have to stay tuned to see uh, what happens with that. LSD microdosing, um, there's a lot of hype about this. I uh, went through and looked at some Reddit channels, uh, but there's little scientific evidence for this practice. Almost all of the claims are based on testimonials of individuals. There is no peer-reviewed um, placebo-controlled studies of any kind that support this practice. Um, the claims include increased creativity, work productivity, and reduced depression. Um, some of that appears to be due to expectancy effects. So it's, there's limited evidence for this practice. So I can't recommend um, this one way or the other. I tell you not to do it one way or the other. Um, but I will say there just is no evidence that this is effective. Psilocybin, um, there's really scant peer-reviewed behavioral data regarding the use of psilocybin to treat depression or PTSD. There's a lot of neo-Freudian, Jungian psychology with psilocybin, um, but nothing, nothing really to hang your hat on. Um, there is, however, cellular neuroscience research to support the notion that psilocybin might be helpful in treating depression. Um, we'll talk more about the cellular neuroscience of depression when we get there, but uh, there is evidence that psilocybin might be helpful. Uh, recently, um, my hometown of Denver, Colorado, decriminalized psilocybin based partially on the belief that it may have medicinal properties. So while you can't legally buy psilocybin mushrooms in Denver, um, you won't be arrested if you have them with you. Um, so that possession is no longer a, a crime. That reaches the end of our discussion of uh, psychedelics, in particular our focus on hallucinogenic compounds. Our next couple of lectures will focus on marijuana and uh, CBD products.